Thanks for tuning in to Retire Hour, the weekly show discussing income planning, investing, tax planning, estate planning, and Medicare. Complete retirement education. Hear from our financial advisors, CPA, estate planning attorney, and Medicare advisor every week. Welcome to Retire Hour. Well, hello, everyone. I'm Matt Goolsby. Thanks for tuning in this week to the show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape that is retirement. This is Retire Hour. We want to be your resource to not only avoiding costly mistakes in retirement, but staying up to date on, like I said, the ever-changing landscape that is retirement, whether it's changing tax laws, changing economy, the changing world geopolitical issues that are out there right now. It's important that you stay up to date and on top of it so that you can enjoy your retirement. Oftentimes we'll find when people come to us, they'll have this burning question or issue that's cost them money or, or hurt them in some way. And you don't want to do that. You want to know about things before they impact you. And that's why it's beneficial to work with this complete team here of estate planning attorneys, Medicare advisors, tax professionals, CPAs, accountants, and enrolled agents, and financial advisors, all under one roof, collaborating and working together for you in retirement. So with our advisor panel here, I've got Danny Goolsby in studio here with us. I've got coming from Studio B, Larry Clefcorn, an advisor with Market Advisory Group, Wichita. And then coming from their Kansas City studios, Jonathan McCoy, an advisor with Market Advisory Group, Kansas City. So in this week's segment of the advisor panel, we'll have some listener questions coming up here after the break. And then, of course, our weekly segment, Find the Fees. But I wanted to start off with what's on everyone's mind, and it's what's moving the markets on almost a minute-by-minute basis. It's not tigers, lions, and bears, oh my. It's inflation, high energy prices, and inverted yield curves, oh my. I mean, what is it? We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but how long will it actually take to find out we're in a recession? The governmental agency that actually declares a recession can come out with that report months later, and then it's already pretty apparent at that point we could be in a recession. But there's a lot of storm clouds on the horizon here, and you need to be working with a team that can make sure they can adjust the sales when necessary. So I'm going to go to Jonathan McCoy in Kansas City. Stagflation concerns. Now, there's another word, stagflation. All these little these words and isms, you have to know what they mean. As the Federal Reserve continues to raise rates and it slows down the growth, basically saying they're going to, in effect, wreck the economy to get inflation under control. But if inflation persists, that could pose a big problem for someone nearing or just entering retirement, right? Well, yeah, I think the obvious answer is yes. I mean, when we look at uh, stock prices dropping, people reliant on, a lot of people anyways, reliant on the stock market to continue to grow over time to provide that interest, those interest earnings, to provide income and retirement at the same time that everything around us is continuing to get more and more expensive. Now, inflation is always around, but we obviously know it's at significantly higher levels now than it's been over the last 30 or 40 years. So we talk all the time with folks about what is it like to retire into a recession. And ultimately, it's not so much how are you going to be reacting in the moment, because oftentimes it's too late. But what is the plan that you've got ahead of time to ensure that not only is your money protected, but you can still provide yourself those income streams that you need and that those income streams can actually grow year over year. When we get together with folks for these one-on-one consultations here in our office, we've got to be looking at investment management solutions that can offset not just the downside risks in the market so that people are not are not having to pull back on their lifestyle and their spending just because the stock market is dropping, but that they can consistently provide themselves those lifetime income streams that uh, that will provide for what they need during a major downturn like what we're seeing now. Yeah, an important point you you hit on there is is try not to be reactionary. I mean, always be proactive with that. And we do that in a lot of things here with the team, not just investment or income planning wise, but also tax wise. So Danny, you know, I heard, I've been hearing from a growing number of farmers that work with us, fertilizers getting expensive, gas is getting expensive. Could a food crisis be our new financial crisis? I mean, with it becoming more expensive to plant, grow, distribute food, could this be the next crisis? And not to mention adding in Europe's bread basket in chaos right now, the world will look to us as supplying the food chain. And we have challenges before that even really totally develops, don't we? Well, yeah, we do. And, um, you know, it's just amazing how fragile uh, everything is. Um, I, over the weekend, I, w- I met with a man who owns a meat company, and he supplies the meats to uh, these national grocery store chains. 
and he was telling me that they have he 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 has not the national chains he has the the supplier to the grocery stores he has three days worth of reserves worth of meat so if you think about that it's like you only have three days worth of reserves of meat uh you know if you think back into the pandemic of 2020 you go into any one of these large stores and you're used to seeing things just uh, uh plenty plentiful everywhere whether it be t- tissue paper or or what have you and the grocery store shelves were were bare. I mean, it was like we were in a third world country. Um, you know, you mentioned Europe. It's amazing how many things that come from different places than the United States. And we're hearing about supply chain breakages and and you know ships out in the harbor that can't be unloaded. So, you know, it's it's amazing. We're we're two years away or out from COVID, and yet we're still feeling the effects of this. Here's the thing I want to bring up to be, about that is. If we're taking two years to get through something, what's it going to take you in retirement to survive something like this? If you're not, if you don't have the ability to withstand some of these things that have never happened in history before, how are you going to survive in retirement? Um, you know, when the next thing that's never happened in history before. Yeah, and you have to you have to have a plan and be prepared there. And and a lot of advisors out there will say, "Don't worry, it always comes back. Don't worry, buy and hold." And yeah, yeah it always comes back. But how long? We call that hopium. Hopium doesn't work. Hopium is that? Where's that on the periodic table? <laughs> so, so Larry Clefcorn there in st- Studio B. You know, come factoring all these things in. I met with a gentleman and his wife the other day, and they said, "You know what? We we're now concerned about our retirement. There's so many things going on. We didn't." envision all these challenges going on in the world and the economy. Well, when do you want to retire? Well, ideally, you know, you'd want to retire in a strong economy, a, a bull market. But what if you retire in a bear market? I mean, th- the fact is you really can't pick. So what are you to do? How do you plan for that? You know, this is a question that comes up uh, in a slight variation of that. When we talk to people and they say, you know, hey, market's at an all time high right now. Why would we want to make a change and buy into new positions? And so that's why it's important that a financial advisor be able to provide for you a tactical and secure option to get started. Sequence of returns is a subject that would take more than this segment to talk about, but that is a, a real you know, strategy that you need to make sure that you are not taking big losses right up front. It, it'll make a big difference. Plus, you, you need the ability to sleep at night. So um, as we talk about this, um, the other component is this makes the tax component even more important. And um, th- that's why we like to say in for today's lesson, the three P's would be plan, plan, plan. That's right. And you have to be proactive. So maybe it's four P's. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we appreciate uh, your guys' uh, input here on the advisor panel. And guys, stay tuned because after this short break, we'll be back with some website listener questions that you guys submitted and we'll be answering on air. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby. I'm uh, I'm back this week. I was on vacation last week. Want to give a big shout out to Rick Everett for filling in for me. Great job, Rick. Appreciate that. When I'm on vacation, he can step in. Rick has a new show weekly called Health in Retirement. Make sure you check that out and check out the uh, listening uh, and viewing times there. You can go to healthinretirement.com or, of course, our website, retirehour.com as well and submit questions that you can ask for us to answer on the show. And in fact, that's what this segment's all about. We have some listener questions here submitted from Shirley and Bruce. I want to get to those. So I'm going to ask Larry this question first. It's from Shirley. It says, I was married for 28 years, then divorced and remarried. That's going to be important. My ex-husband passed six years ago. Am I eligible for any of his Social Security? There's a lot to unpack there, isn't there, Larry? There is. Um, So let's start with what would be, in most cases, the um, disqualifier, and that is that you remarried. So if you if you remarried and you've um, um, been married for less than ten years. 
and then let me put it this way if you on the second husband if you divorced after 10 years you could pick either one but if you're still married then um, you don't get the opportunity to file on your ex-husband now this opens the door to another question that often comes up and that is in regard to uh, the death and a widow benefit for survivors and um, there are special rules that go along with that I would encourage every uh, lady out there that's viewing is you can go on the Social Security uh, website and you can take a um, you can find I think it's five things every woman should know about Social Security it's a great little article it's it, it doesn't go too far in depth but it does give you some information and some guidance yeah, and, and I would actually take that even a step further. If you have any Social Security questions, feel free to come in and talk with us. I mean, there's all kinds of different scenarios that come into play on when you should maybe file for Social Security. If you're married, there's a lot of different options, specifically, mainly on looking at longevity and then also tax consequences. You always want to know what something's going to cost you before it costs you money, specifically with taxes. And so many people just file and then just go on their way and then they figure out in February, March, and April and that's exactly the wrong time to be filing, figuring out when you're filing your taxes if you owe. You want to make sure you don't owe anything and be proactive with that. So if you want to have a conversation with our team, feel free to reach out at 833-888-HOUR or that's 833-888-4687 or go right to our website retirehour.com and you can book your consultation right there. We have offices across Kansas and Missouri. We'd love to have a conversation with you. In fact, just the other day, I had a 30 minute phone call with someone that had called in and just wanted to chit chat with some things. Feel free to take advantage of that. We're here as that resource with our complete team, our estate planning division, Medicare group, tax group, of course, and then the investment advisors. Jonathan McCoy, an advisor in Kansas City there. You have a question from Bruce. And it's actually a two-part question. I'll give you the first part, and then we'll go to Danny next. It's on income planning and investing. Question number one is, I am 62. How much should I start putting into my company's 401k after taxes? There's a little bit of a maybe confusion there, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's so I would make the assumption that Bruce's question is in regards to contributing to a 401k on the Roth side. In other words, you're paying taxes on that money as it goes into the 401k, as opposed to the traditional contributions, which give you a reduction in taxable income for every dollar that you contribute to the traditional portion of the 401k. This is, I mean, you, you insinuated and, and alluded to the fact that even with Shirley's question previously, that she should come in and talk to, talk to us and, and look at those social security questions. Well, this is one of those prime tax management questions for both while you're working and after you're retired, that our tax team has to look at what is the tax implication of that money as it goes into the 401k today, what is your taxable income while you're still working versus what you're actually going to need to live on and what that taxable picture, taxable income picture looks like after you retire. It's, it's a, a fairly straightforward juxtaposition that our tax team makes, but we have to dig through how much money do you have already saved in pre-tax assets in your 401k in, in an effort to determine does it make sense to start contributing to the Roth or after-tax portion of the 401k. It's a, it's a fairly straightforward conversation to have, but without knowing more information on what your pre-retirement and post-retirement income picture looks like, it's a very difficult question to answer. Yeah, it can depend on a m multitude of other factors, and, and then we'd love to again have that conversation with Bruce. But Bruce's part two question we'll give to Danny here. What are the pro cons of Series I savings bonds? So uh, an I bond is an inflation protected security that uh, is guaranteed by the U.S. Treasury, and it pays interest for 30 years, and at a fixed rate. Currently, that fixed rate's zero, but the uh, attraction of an I bond would be that they are adjusted for inflation, and it's two times a year. I think it's May and November, and um, this last May, I believe they were paying over 7%, which again is, is good for the I-bond, but it just also is kind of a left-handed or an indictment of, of how hot inflation is running. So inflations are, or excuse me, I-bonds are good for, for inflation, um, but there's a couple of catches to those. And so, and one of those catches is number one is you have to hold it at least a year. They pay interest for 30 years, 
but you have to hold it. You enter, enter or excuse me, uh, you have to hold it for one year, and uh, to get anything. And if you hold it if up to five years, you don't have to pay a penalty. If you break it before five years, then you'll have to pay about three months worth of interest and a penalty to to get it out. So always a trade off, right? There is always a trade off. Always a catch there. So if you want to have a conversation, or if you have any questions you'd like to submit. Feel free to go to our website, retirehour.com. Submit your questions there. Provide us with your mailing address. We'll even mail you out a coffee mug, an umbrella, a hat, a bag, a portable battery charger. There's lots of options there on the website to select your gift. We'd love to send you a thank you for submitting your question. Or you can call us at 833-888-HOUR, or that's 833-888-4687. Or like I said, go right to the website, retirehour.com, and you can book your consultation with this complete team tax group, Medicare group, estate planning advisors, and then, of course, investment advisors as well. Well, stay tuned. We'll be right back after this with our weekly segment of Find the Fees. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby. In this week's segment of Find the Fees, we're going to be discussing final expense policies and what are they and what's the catch. It's time to find the fees. So, Larry Clefcorn, what are final expense policies in a nutshell? They're an insurance policies and that the name final expense gives you the the clue that it is primarily most people think of for burial to take care of their funeral expenses but it can be used for other things um, one of the things that's unique about final expense is oftentimes they don't require physicals and uh, there isn't much health underwriting to it in fact sometimes it's as simple of are you in a nursing home? And as long as you're not in a nursing home, there are so, you can even get a guaranteed issue uh, if you have other health problems. So uh, those are some of the things. Now, one of the other one of the other things I would mention is look for one that has a guaranteed level premium, so the premium won't be going up on you in the future, and um, um, the the a person might say, why would I do this at all? And the, one of the answers to that would be so that you can leverage your money and pass on the risk to an insurance company. Sure. So Jonathan McCoy in Kansas City, there's got to be a catch here to this guaranteed issue, right? I mean, uh, so if you're, if you're, as long as you're not in a nursing home, as long as you haven't had open heart surgery in the past, like 30 days, I've seen those questions before. And then also I've seen some questions out there for, do you have HIV or AIDS? And then if, if you can answer no to all those questions, then you're approved no matter what's going on in your health history. So what's going on? What's the catch here to this guaranteed issue? Well, very directly, the typical trade-off is these policies can become much more expensive than the other types of insurance or coverages that can be used for these same types of final expense costs, such as you know traditional life insurance. Not having underwriting in, this, in the beginning of the process of applying for this uh, type of coverage means that the insurance company does not have a real good gauge on how much of a risk you are that they may have to pay out on this policy sooner than they expect. So to offset that risk, they're gonna charge you more money to help pay for that. Now the trade-off, you mentioned the perfect term at the end of the last segment, Matt, but the trade-off here is the guaranteed acceptance can be something that's a benefit for folks who might be in ill health, but maybe not in a, a nursing home yet or, or not having you know life-threatening circumstances with their health. But that guaranteed issue, typically the, the main trade-off is much higher out-of-pocket monthly premiums or annual premiums uh, to offset the fact that you did not give the insurance company a good indication of what your current health status is. Yeah, so maybe if you can actually go through full underwriting and you're looking to do that, then maybe you can actually get more affordable coverage that way. But again, like you, you mentioned, if there's something going on in your health history where you can't really get coverage because of you've been declined from other insurance companies, might be your only option to go, but still you want to weigh that because, you know, Danny, less medical questions probably means like we're talking about higher premiums. And could you actually end up paying more into the policy than it will eventually pay out? Significantly. Yes. Um, you know, there was a famous national TV spokesman, uh, Alex, somebody or another that, uh, used to come on all the time on TV and say, you know, that, uh, 
you're guaranteed to be covered and premiums are very, very low, you know, and we'll never raise your premiums going forward. Well, that sounded really good. And, but again, like we talked about last segment, there's a trade-off and the trade-off is, is those, those instruments are usually what's called loaded instruments or they have heavy internal costs to them. And so, in, in other words, you're not buying that much life insurance for what you're spending. You, you may be getting guaranteed coverage, but there also may be what's called a two-year incontestability clause where you have to wait uh, before death benefits. And if you were to pass away in, in those first two years, then the company would pay back the, the premiums you paid in and not and, and not the death benefit. So there's a whole bunch of uh, gotchas here. And I recommend if you have questions about those, come in and see us because uh, they're, they're, there's a whole lot more there than just meets the eye. Yeah, and on the surface, sometimes they look really attractive, but you have to dig through those things and figure out What's the catch? We talk about that in our book, The Investor Catch, as far as you have to know where the trade-offs are. You have to know where the gotchas, like you said. And if you want to have that conversation, feel free to reach out to us at 833-888-4687, or that's 833-888-HOUR, or go right to our website, retirehour.com, or you can even email us, ask ASK at retirehour.com. We'd love to have a no-cost, complimentary consultation with you, whether you have concerns about the economy, your retirement plans, your investments, when to take Social Security, tax issues, estate planning issues, Medicare questions, all under one roof right here, collaborating for a cohesive plan for you in retirement to make sure that you're not missing anything and that you can, Larry alluded to it a little bit earlier, the SWAN plan, sleep well at night. We'll stay tuned because after the break, we'll have another listener question here with our Medicare segment with Bill Vodder of Market Medicare Advisors. Mary asks about the donut hole. That's I don't think that's what you might might think those powdered things are from the from the coffee shop. There's something called the donut hole with Medicare. In our state planning segment, we'll have another question as well about someone wanting to leave some money to their grandkids. And then finally, in our tax segment with lead CPA Joshua Sakura here at the end of the hour. We'll be talking about why it's beneficial when forming an estate plan, whether it's a trust or any kind of special vehicle that way, to have someone that can speak the tax language there because we met with someone just this past week that had a pretty big surprise that they were getting tax advice from the wrong person. Well, stay tuned. We'll be back with more Retire Hour right after this break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby, the weekly show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape that is retirement. This whole team here, whether it's investment advisors, whether it's estate planning officials or attorneys, and then also tax advisors, and then of course, Medicare advisors, we all work together for you to have a better retirement and a more comprehensive retirement as far as these professionals talking to one another. It happens all the time. I'll get questions with meeting with people one-on-one -on -one and they'll say, you know what? We're not on Medicare yet. And we've got these questions and it's very beneficial to go down the hall and grab one of our Medicare team members and they come in and they get answers in the moment when they ask the question. I never have to say, yeah, I've got someone I can refer you to. Call this person. I don't really handle that. Or you know what? That's really not something we talk about here. You'll have to go find answers elsewhere. So in studio with me, I've got our lead advisor with Market Medicare Advisors, Bill Vodder, and we've got a question from the website. If you want to submit your question on the website, go out to retirehour.com. Questions from Mary, and she asks, I will be retiring soon and looking at my Medicare options. My friend told me about the donut hole. Should I be concerned with that? So what is the donut hole? That's not the little powdered things we get at the coffee <laughs> no. shop and we, they go no. with their coffee. No, it has nothing, not... nothing to do with the coffee break. <laughs> what is Before I answer that question, though, I'd like to address something you were just talking about. Yesterday afternoon, I had a lady in my office to talk about Medicare. She's approaching retiring. She wanted to get her ducks in a row, wanted to know what her costs were. But then the question came up about Irma. And, you know, well, what's, how's this affect my income and what's that, what's that do to me? And I step around the corner and I say, hey, Josh, you got a minute. Josh was a CPA. He's so he the CPA. He comes into my office. He spends about five minutes with her and he gets her settled down on that. So she knows exactly where she stands with that. Well, then later on in the conversation, she tells me that 
Her mom's in the hospital, been there for several days, looking to go to a nursing home. They're starting to look at Medicaid planning, and she has legal questions. Well, Gerald wasn't here yesterday afternoon, but his assistant was. And so I was able to pull her into the interview, and she was able to answer some questions and get this lady steered in the right direction. So what I'm saying is, is these resources, they don't just benefit you. They benefit all of us. We're all able to to benefit from each other. You're you're so true. And, you know, um, before we all started working as a team about seven years ago like this, I'm sure it frustrated you because it frustrated me when even if we knew the answer, we're not licensed to give that advice. Right. And, And we couldn't help these people with the questions, and it was frustrating. So it's why we banded together to work like we have, and it's just uh, people are coming to us in droves and, and realizing there's a, there's a better way, a more complete way, and that's what we do here. So on to the donut hole question. Back to Mary's question from the website. Okay. What, what is the donut hole? All right, so to understand this and where the name come from, you have to go clear back to the very beginning when Medicare started having prescription drug coverage. Medicare hasn't always had prescription drug coverage. Uh, this came about, I'm going to say, a little over 15 years ago. And, and when it was originally designed, the Medicare system was set up to help people at that time with roughly the first $3,000 of prescriptions. $3,000 for most people would most people would take care of them. And then there was this, it affectionately became called the donut <laughs> hole. Uh, so... The first $3,000, they helped you cover that. And then if you had used more than $3,000 of prescriptions, there was no coverage. There there was a point of time where you had to cover the next, I'm talk, I like to talk in round numbers, you had to t- cover the next $5,000, period. I mean, there was no help. You had to cover the next $5,000 of prescriptions. And then you entered what was called the catastrophic coverage. And at that point, they started to pay not all, but the majority of your cost for prescriptions. And so that $5,000 gap in there became called the donut hole because it was in the middle. It was in the middle of this donut here, and you fell into the donut hole. So you said, is this something that you, you mentioned, is this not around anymore? I mean, it used to be this way, or is it it's still there? Um, no, it's not there anymore. It was phased out several years ago. It was part. There was a piece of it tied in with the Affordable Care Act, uh, and then there was another change that came along while President Trump was in office, a bill that he signed. But uh, it's been phased out. They still refer to it as gap coverage. I really refer to it in the Medicare system with prescription drugs. There are three phases that a person might pass through over the course of the year. The initial phase um, has usually has co-payments built into it that are maybe zero or three or four dollars for a generic drug. And then as it there's different tiers, the higher the tier, you're talking about brand names and the co-payments get higher. But the initial phase is the first $4,430. So this is a number that's adjusted with inflation. So it's risen from 3000 up to now $4,430. And frankly, a lot of clients never really get beyond that. That's enough coverage. But if you used more than $4,430 of prescriptions, then you move into what the way I describe it, phase two. In phase two, the copayments will change. On, in most cases, or many cases, they go to a straight 25% copay for generic and brand name drugs. And you stay in the second phase until your out of pocket cost reaches $7,050. So that's the copayments you paid in the initial phase plus the copayments you paid in the second phase. And so that 5000 that was originally where you had no coverage, they, you now have coverage, um, but you could still have a lot of out-of-pocket expense there, 7050 If you have more than that, then you move into the third, the catastrophic coverage, the third phase. And there, the co-payments are either $3.95. It's, it's the greater of. For generic, it's $3.95 or 5%, and brand names is $9.85 or 5%, whichever is greater. But that's the catastrophic coverage. So there was always initial coverage, there was always catastrophic coverage, but there wasn't always coverage in the middle, and it became known as the donut hole. So they're they're changing that, and, and so the donut hole 
as it was previously known as, is gone away, but there's still that second phase right. that you're talking about. How do you even, as, as an individual, let alone as a Medicare advisor, take, take you and your team out of the, the equation, how does someone even keep track of this stuff? You know, some people try to do it on their own. And I, you know, we always tell people it costs nothing to come in and talk to us. And I, this guy I had a guy in here yesterday afternoon. I mean, and he had, he had done his research. He'd done a lot of reading and he was still totally confused. But after he sat and visited with me for an hour and let me walk him through the differences in the two versions of Medicare, he, when he was done, he was granted from ear to ear. He said, you know, he says, I understand it now. He says, I, I feel like I can make a reasonable decision. going to go home, visit with my wife. I'll get back with you in the next few days. And so, you know, I, we kind of narrow it, <laughs> narrow down the things that you really need to focus on. Well, everyone's situation is different and they, they might be looking at things that don't necessarily apply to them. And you, you talk about their individual situation. And mm -hmm. if you guys want to have a conversation with this team, feel free to reach out at 833-888-HOUR, or that's 833-888-4687, or go right to the website, retirehour.com, and you can book your complimentary consultation right there with any member of the team or the whole team together right there. And we want to be that resource for you to make sure you get this information and you know about these things before they cost you money. We'll stay tuned because we'll be right back with our estate planning segment with another listener question from Bob. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby, the show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape that is retirement. In this week's segment with estate planning, we've got a listener question from Bob, and he asks on the website, I want to leave money to my grandkids they range in age from newborn, I guess recently just born, to 16 years old. I've looked at 529 plans, but do not think I want to go that route. What are some options for me? Well, uh, there's several options, obviously. Um, you know, one of the things with 529 plans that a lot of people don't want to use is because they're only so useful for education. If you withdraw the money for anything else, it's subject to a penalty. So that's not a very good plan for somebody who's trying to leave money for the purpose of sustaining and maintaining maybe their grandkids. Uh, you can do an irrevocable trust as well. I mean, a revocable trust. I, I, I <laughs> you can do a revocable trust as well where you leave money and you control it during your lifetime. And when you die, then the trust becomes irrevocable and the money passes to the grandchildren. Now, I think in this case... Part of the problem is that we have children of all different ages. Mm -hmm. And so distribution is going to have to start at some point for the 16-year-old when so, he goes to college or he needs money to buy a car or whatever the trustee decides. So the best option for this person will be an irrevocable trust. The reason for that is twofold. One is it sets the parameters and they are... Uh, said during the life of the grantor, who is the person donating the money, uh, Bob in this case. Um, and it removes the money from his estate. And that's a crucial issue because that means that money, after three years of being contributed, will no longer be part of Bob's estate. So For estate tax purposes. For estate tax purposes. Now, Medicaid would be longer than that. Medicaid would be five years, correct. If, if he were to need Medicaid within five years, that money would be considered still available to Bob, even though he can't get to it. Uh, but this way, Bob can put the money in trust, protect it, and I believe the idea was to use his son to ma to be the trustee, and he would be able, we, we divided all the money into shares for each of the grandchildren to be able to provide for each grandchild as the age out, and we also provided an age at which point they can just take the money. Yeah, so in that scenario, it's, it's kind of complicated because if you, I mean, if you're, if you're, got children, grandchildren of all different ages. Well, if you donate 
a thousand dollars for the youngest one, and hopefully it grows over time. Do you have to donate the same thousand dollars for the sixteen, or do you have to donate fifteen? So you said in that scenario you do shares. Right. Well, we just split everything into fourths. Now the advantage obviously will be that the the just born child will have a lot more uh, in his subtrust by the time he reaches the same age as the oldest child right now. Uh, he'll have 15 years of growth or 16 years of growth, I guess, and would be able to, you know, take advantage of that. But the Bob wanted to be fair with all and treat them all equally from the get go. You can engage in some more complicated calculations and try to figure out how you can make everyone even from the start for you know the future but that gets complicated and it could be an unnecessary expense in trying to figure that out so this isn't maybe something that happens every day this is a, no you're, you're talking this is happening you're you're is you're saying you want to be fair you're giving details here this is something that you're doing right now yes that's correct okay that's correct. so interesting okay so so but when you're doing this there's probably extenuating circumstances why he wants to do this right i mean because Maybe he doesn't want to just give the money to the parents or... Right. Well, per, the, one of the big things, I think, is he wants to protect the money just because he doesn't know what the future holds. If he sets aside this money and puts it in a revocable trust, it will never be available to any of his creditors. It will not be available in his state. And after the five years pass, it would not be available for Medicaid. And then uh, because there's there's... I don't want to say simpler ways because this is there's a little, this is a process here, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it takes time to set this up. You know, you're going to have to set up special accounts for the new trust because it's irrevocable. It's going to become its own entity, and it's going to drive its own. Uh, it's going to have its own tax ID number. So there's a real process in creating these trusts, uh, but for the purpose that he had in mind, this was the ideal vehicle. And so now you're going to work with an investment advisor on picking the investments? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, my job is to create the, the structure. Uh, it's it's uh, Bob's job with an, an investor to determine how that money will be invested um, for the grandchildren because you don't want to just leave that money sitting around and doing nothing yeah hopefully that grows for him so that's and, right and again this is just another story and a line of thousands of examples we're working together all under one roof benefits the people here because they have access to the estate planning attorney gerald and his team the investment advisors the tax professionals cpas enrolled agents accountants also Medicare advisors, we work all together under one roof. We're never referring someone out saying, hey, yeah, I've got this guy down the street. Go talk to him and then come back and see me. Just doesn't work that way. It's, it's not efficient. If you want to have a conversation with this team, feel free to reach out at 833-888-HOUR or that's 833-888-4687 or go right to our website, retirehour.com. We've got offices across Kansas and Missouri. We'd love to have a complimentary consultation with you guys and talk about any concerns you have maybe point out anything we see. We'll stay tuned. We'll be right back with our final segment, Joshua Sikora, lead CPA with Market Tax Services. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Retire Hour. I'm Matt Goolsby, the weekly show that helps you stay up to date on the ever-changing landscape that is retirement with a complete team here, not just investment advisors, but also Medicare advisors, estate planning attorneys, and then finally in this segment, our lead CPA tax advisors. And, you know, we've talked many times, there's a big difference between tax advisors and just tax preparers. And this is one of those examples where it's just so crucial that we're all under one roof because in this example, someone was getting bad advice and was not talking with the whole team that they needed to be. And now they're working with us. 
So tell us about this example here. And I know you got a little bit of a cold. Yeah. So there's a there's a big invisible plexiglass between us here. Yeah. <laughs> so bless yeah. your heart. But tell us a little bit about this yeah. story. I don't know that they were getting bad advice. I think they were just getting no advice at all. So we're working with this uh, couple. They have a, a trust that's helping take care of one of their parents. And we're working through the return and they're paying all these random expenses for the for the grantor of the trust, the person who started it. Um, who, who's elderly now and, and needs, you know, help be taking care of them. And it just didn't, it didn't seem right. And so we started going through the, the trust document and as you well know, I'm not an attorney. I didn't, didn't really go to law school. Uh, and so we were able to loop in our attorney, you know, Gerald Eidelman, and he gave his attorney read through the trust and was able to then tell us that, yeah, they can do this. No, they can't do that. And then how we can then rectify it for what's already happened and do it appropriately going forward. And I think it really worked out well for, for this couple in question because they didn't really know what, what they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. They had just always kind of done this and no tax preparer had ever told them it was wrong. And so they just, you know, Get, kept kept on going with what was working, and and it wasn't until that we were able to bring this team approach to play, and not just deal with the the taxes, but also provide that legal advice of interpreting the trust document appropriately, that they're able to get the right answer. So that should something flare up in the future, they've they've done the appropriate things. You know, it seems to happen more often than not where people and 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 you you and I see it all the time. There's different personalities out there, and some of them are real planners. Mm-hmm. They they want to get this done. They want to get it done in advance. They want to get this detail. But if they go to someone that has the estate plan or the trust created, mm-hmm. which in this case, this is what this couple had for their parents done, then they go to someone else to have the taxes prepared, and there's no coordination or no collaboration there, then there's a disconnect. Right. And, and the the attorney has, has now drafted the trust and they're out of the picture. They've mm-hmm. collected their fee. They've gone unless you need to go back to them. It's it's not happening. Right. But what has to happen every year? Well, there has to be a trust tax return filed every year. Mm-hmm. Then that's where you guys are coming into play. They're working with us now. And it's like, well, we have these questions. And just you, like you said, we could kick that over to our state planning attorney d- department and say, hey, what do you what do you think about this, this and this? Mm hmm. And now they're working with an investment advisor because the trust has investments. So right. you guys are all working together and they're getting better advice. Could the IRS, I mean, I know the audit risk is is low because anyways, but had the IRS come in and audited things, there would have been some big problems. Absolutely. The, the IRS would have said that, hey, you guys are, are paying things out of this trust that are not allowed. Those need to be treated differently. It's going to incur these taxes because it's from years past. There's penalties. There's interest. It's ugly. Um, and so because we're able to go through and, and talk about it with them and discuss it, not just from the tax side, but then the legal side and then bouncing back to the tax side, we're able not just to correct what's happened, but then make appropriate plan going forward. And, and really, it comes back to that, that team approach, right? Because as a tax preparer, my duty of care is for you to tell me what you did with the trust, and then I prepare a tax return appropriately. But my my obligation isn't to tell you how that trust should be handled. That's legal advice. And so a lot of preparers wouldn't have been able to tell them how, how they should be handling the trust. And that's the great thing about having Gerald here to work with us is that we can not just say, okay, here's what you did. So here's the corresponding tax return. We can say, here's what you did. Here's what you should have done. And we know this because we got the, the legal advice you needed. And can you imagine that headache? How did they had to go back and forth from their tax preparer to the attorney, back and forth, back and forth, and then the billable hours from the attorney and this yep. and going back and forth, back and forth. And then something could have been dropped. Right, right. Because both on the legal side and the tax side, there's so much technical nuance, so much jargon in play that as a uninitiated person, layperson, you may not catch a, catch all the different distinctions and subtleties of what's being discussed. So I, I often will talk about in our different classes we teach around the metros, you have to speak this language. Right. And if you don't know the vocabulary words, if you don't know the terminologies, if you don't know the formulas, if you don't know the rules, somewhere it's possible that it's going to bite you. And then when you find out about it, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Now you just have to prepare to maybe insulate yourself going forward. And that's what we do here as a team approach. It's a team approach. It's not about one or the other is any more important than the other. We work together collaborating for you to make sure that you're getting the cohesive, complete plan that you need 
and answers to your questions in the moment. My sixth grade science teacher, Mr. Lester, said in science, when often one question gets answered in science, it splinters into several. We found that to be true as well. When you get an answer to your question, then it needs a follow-up, and we don't have to ping-pong you back and forth between the different professionals or say, I have someone you can talk to. We get together right here working for you. So if you want to have that conversation, feel free to reach out to us at 833-888-HOUR, or that's 833-888-4687, or go right to our website, retirehour.com. You can book your complimentary consultation with this complete team in many of our offices across Kansas and Missouri, We'd love to have a conversation with you to see what you might be missing, answer any concerns you have, or point out anything we see that you need to be paying attention to. Well, that's all the time we have this week for Retire Hour. We'll see you next week right back here. and opinions expressed in this program do not represent financial, medical, tax, or legal advice. Please consult with a competent professional to provide advice tailored to your needs and circumstances. Investment advisory services are offered through Foundations Investment Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. 